right, I think we're ready to get started. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us um, on this morning of the final day of uh, what has been another fantastic ASU GSV Summit. Um, my name is Joe Watt, and I lead ECMC Group's Education Impact Fund. Um, our Education Impact Fund is investing in early stage companies and funds that are improving post-secondary um, and workforce access and outcomes for underserved learners. Um, in addition to this, our, our organization um, also makes um, strategic grants and program-related investments through our foundation. Um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion because as I just sort of described, our organization thinks about this kind of topic a lot, as, as do the rest of the panelists um, that I'm honored to be joined with here today. Um, as you can tell from the title, it's, it's, in, it's really about engaging a diverse group of stakeholders, and I think we have that that group well represented here with our, um, with our panelists. And, and so the goal is really about understanding how to unlock different types of capital to drive innovation um, and impact in the education space. So we're gonna talk about the different types of capital that exist, um, grants, PRIs, market rate investments, um, what they mean, how best to leverage them in different contexts. Um, and each of them is powerful in their own context, but I think one thing we really want to amplify today is um, how they can work really well in concert and how impactful they can be when, when working across those different, um, those different levers, either within one organization or, or across partnerships. Um, and so really with the goal of helping, hopefully folks in the audience here, um, unlock those sources of capital in your own work um, to drive innovation. So if there's um, folks from foundations that are making grants but aren't making impact investments, um, if there are impact investors here that want to better draft off of the philanthropic work of, of um, foundations, and then there also might be educators or entrepreneurs here that are trying to unlock these sources of capital to align um, to the needs of their students or their constituents. Um, those are all things that we want um, folks in the audience and uh, to be able to walk away with sort of actionable strategies and perspectives on. Um, so with that, maybe we can, we can dive in here. And before we, we get into some of the depths of the conversation, I did want to sort of start with some definitions to make sure we're all on equal, equal footing here about, about the different types of capital that we're going to talk about. Really grants, program-related investments, and um, market rate investments. And I'm going to start with some very, very simplistic definitions, then I'd like to open it up to the panelists here to, one, introduce themselves, talk about the perspective that your organization is bringing to the, to the conversation here, if you're investing, what types of capital you're investing, um, and then add nuance to the definitions that we'll, that we'll lay out here. So, so first, grants, right? These are, these are funds that are being given by an organization, um, typically a, a foundation or another charitable organization with no expectation of return of that capital, right? A program-related investment is different in that there is an expectation of return of capital. However, it's not a market rate expectation. It's going to be concessionary, um, typically through very low interest rate debt um, or, or other structures. And then finally, a market rate investment or an MRI, it's, as they're sometimes called, or sometimes just impact investments are typically made to, to for-profit institutions or organizations um, with a market rate expectation of return along with impact. Um, so maybe starting with Jess, um, I'll kick it to you. And if you want to introduce yourself, talk about what of those, of those instruments your organization is doing, and then if there's any sort of distinctions or nuance or context you want to add to those definitions. Thanks, Joe. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Jessica Hinkle from Strata Education Foundation. Uh, we're a social impact organization that is focused on supporting programs and policies and organizations that strengthen connections between post-secondary education and training and employment, and really focused on increasing economic mobility for more Americans. Um, so we are not a traditional 
private foundation, um, which means that we don't technically have to, um, uh, I guess, segment our investments between PRIs and MRIs. Um, so I think one of the things that is unique about us is that as an, an operating foundation, we have the opportunity to be able to invest in um, early, early stage, more catalytic um, uh, opportunities that perhaps aren't, um, wouldn't necessarily fit the kind of legal definition of a PRI. Um, and where we could um, be able to kind of sit alongside the cap table with some of some of our peers here um, who might be considering it a, a PRI. Um, but for us, we don't have to kind of go through a lot of those legal justifications. Um, we are an organization that uh, uses multiple levers um, to advance our mission. So in addition to the strategic investments area that I lead, we also do grants and research. And I think one of the things that's most important for us is not siloing the activities of these different levers, but really trying to work in concert. So we've had um, a few opportunities at Strata, and we you know, look forward to having more where perhaps we've made an investment in a company, and then we have an opportunity to, um, to do some research with that, that, that company, and then also be able to um, pair a, a grant opportunity, perhaps not directly to the company, but through an association where we're able to, to support their advancement. Hi, I'm Michael Sorrell. I'm the president at Paul Quinn College in Dallas, Texas, and we like to receive money from places like Strata. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and they have been a very generous supporter of our work. Uh, we are in the process of scaling the small college model. We are a liberal arts inspired institution. Uh, we are building out the urban work college model. If you come to Paul Quinn, you get a job. That's the basic premise of it. Our students receive internships where they work an average of 15 hours a week at jobs we go out and find for them. Uh, the jobs radically transform their economic prospects uh, and quite frankly their lives. 75% uh, of our students on an annualized basis are Pell Grant students. Uh, they come from the lowest socioeconomic strata and they are students. Our entry requirement is about a 3.0 grade point average. Um, but they're coming from inner city public school systems. So that 3.0 might stand for a range of academic preparedness levels. Uh, our students are going to work places that they would not have access to if not for our program. Uh, we're in the process now of identifying cities to begin the scaling model. Our goal is to create a global network of urban work colleges. Our mission is the eradication of intergenerational poverty. We love to hear schools talk about uh, an education cures poverty. With all due respect, we think money cures poverty. So we're gonna go out and create better economic opportunities, move people from shifts, and stop thinking about jobs to start thinking about careers. Good morning, everyone. I am Tyra Mariani, president of the Schultz Family Foundation based in Seattle. Our work is about creating a greater opportunity that is accessible to all, and we do that by investing in underrepresented entrepreneurs' ecosystems. So consider anything from research and policy to direct investment in businesses to uh, making more capital, particularly non-predatory capital, available to underrepresented entrepreneurs. We also invest in 16 to 24-year-olds at their point of transition to help them get on a path to upward mobility. So we work with organizations and partner with organizations who are uh, really serving those who, address, who have higher barriers due to their background and identity. And again, looking at those points when they're coming from systems. So once Paul Quinn has done its job, it's the question of how do we help them successfully transition so that they're getting a job commensurate with the level of investment that they've made, whether it be training or college, for example. We, uh, similar to Jessica, we are structured, we're a private family foundation. We have lots of flexibility, which is really, really nice. We have many levers that we can exercise. So we can do the PRIs, we can do the MRIs. Most of our money goes to traditional grant making. So um, we tend to really think about what we're trying to accomplish with whomever we're partnering with and supporting. 
and then try to figure out the best instrument for the partner that we're investing in. So there have been instances where we could make a grant or we could make a loan and have that capital paid back. Uh, there are some instances where we make a straight investment. It might be a debt. It might be equity. It might be neither. So we have the beauty of our structure is that we have lots of flexibility from investing the assets of the foundation to the traditional annual grant making that we do. So look forward to the conversation. Uh, I'm Drew, CEO of Mainstay. We're a growth stage company. Uh, we're a retention platform for students consistently proven to uh, boost enrollment, year-to-year uh, -year retention, and academic success uh, in higher education. And we do this particularly by um, taking the best research in cognitive and behavioral science and applying it at scale with artificial intelligence uh, through conversational AI. Uh, basically, we talk to students every day, uh, about five to six million of them right now, and help them overcome the barriers that stand in their way of getting a degree and transitioning to a fulfilling career. <clears throat> uh, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to help about a million more folks graduate college uh, this decade than would have otherwise. Uh, in, in doing so, drive about a trillion dollars in economic mobility for the folks who are traditionally left behind by higher education. Um, and as a company, we've been sort of the beneficiary of all of the funds available. Uh, and so I'll just share. Um, and sometimes, actually, inadvertently, we didn't even realize um, because many uh, foundations uh, will invest in venture capital firms. Uh, a lot of the impact investors uh, that you see around the table uh, and VCs are getting their money from philanthropy as well. Uh, Philanthropy is also always funding innovation in the education sector, so we've actually been the lucky beneficiary of funds from various foundations without fully realizing that uh, that was happening behind the scenes. Uh, and we've also been lucky to you know, be part of the table of conversation and, and bring together some funds to do some really innovative things together uh, to have, for instance, a purpose-built product specifically for uh, historically black college and, colleges and universities. Uh, to really make a contextually appropriate product uh, to solve the unique challenges there. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm glad to uh, have more of the conversation, share a little bit no more nuance in a bit. Thanks all. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, it's worth noting, yeah, there's a uh, sort of additional source of funds, not just from philanthropy, but also public dollars. Um, we've also got some state contracts uh, and some federal funds coming to us. And interestingly enough, it, the orchestration of these things is really pivotal. Uh, and we've done a bunch of research consistently proving our outcomes. Uh, and those are the sort of proof points that are often so utterly important for the uh, policymakers who have the really the largest levers of change. So for instance, um, six states, Washington and Texas being the leaders, uh, we work with, um, for, for instance, about 97% of all incoming freshmen in the state of Texas every year, uh, and in the state of Washington, all free and reduced lunch students and their parents uh, in, to help them transition from high school to college, uh, and basically having these conversations to demystify uh, and uh, streamline the process for them. Yeah, thanks for the reminder, Tyra. Yes, the, the, the third day of ASU GSV. Uh, I normally pace myself to lose my voice just as I get on the plane. Uh, it's come a little early this time, so bear with me. Um, my name is Henry Hips. I am a senior advisor and entrepreneur in residence at Owl Ventures, which is the largest education-focused VC firm in the world. Um, the portfolio includes um, investees across the education spectrum, um, all the way up through workforce, lifelong learning, and formal learning. Um, my EIR is focused on a new ed tech venture studio um, that I'm spinning up. Uh, it is currently codenamed Venture Studio X. Um, and the focus is on commercializing evidence-based um, interventions uh, that are impactful and that are truly scalable and ultimately venture-backable. Um, prior to that, and you know, my former life on the leadership team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is where I had an opportunity to work with several of the folks here and several of you in the audience. I named that also because it, there's a very specific example and Drew alluded to this. Um, my timing's probably a little bit off, but for sake of rounding up about 10 years ago, um, the impact investing space around education innovation looked very different. It was really sparse. 
and there was a very clear strategy at the Gates Foundation um, to anchor a couple of funds that were meant to be education specific and to really demonstrate what might be possible by thinking about ed tech as a specific asset class and then ultimately bring different types of capital um, in as LPs. Um, two funds that uh, were anchored from the, the Gates Foundation at that time uh, as anchor LPs were Reach Capital and Owl Ventures. And, and both of those, as, as many know in the room, um, have been incredibly successful and um, have, inc have great portfolios. It's actually how Drew and I met many years ago. Um, but as important, you have much more diversity um, in that LP base, which demonstrates that folks are interested um, in the possibility of, of both impact and returns in the space. Um, the one other thing that I would, I would add uh, is the government as, as, as an investment actor. Um, Drew mentioned the importance of the, govern, the government in terms of funds um, as the buyer in many cases. Another really important source of capital from the government is at the earliest stages of pipeline around impact investing, which, is, which ultimately ought to be about the earlier stages of R&D and specifically applied research, right? That happens much more effectively in other sectors. Uh, there would have been no COVID vaccine if there had not been billions of dollars of federal money that moved against that um, for many years. The government's track record has been spotty in the education space to say the least, um, but they are making some progress, particularly with the most recent budget um, and the, the likelihood that they'll, they'll be able to finally get to that vision of launching a DARPA for education. So I name that, um, because back to this question of coordination and integration across the types of capital, that's a really important role for the federal government to play uh, because many other actors in the capital stack don't have the incentives to make those types of investments at that stage. So maybe just building off of the, the, the point, Drew, that you made around accepting all these different types of capital and, and, and Henry, the the role that they can play at different stages. I mean, how should um, entrepreneurs be thinking about sequencing? About what what's the the best lever from a from a capital source perspective to pull at what time, and what are the conditions that drive um, success there? Uh, we know uh, from making a lot of mistakes. So I'll tell you some things that are have served us and some things that haven't. Uh, early on, uh, actually, I think through funding from the Gates Foundation, our work at Georgia State, mm -hmm. we were able to not only work with a partner that was able to take a risk with us, but run some research to prove the impact. Uh, that was incredibly game-changing for us. Um, risky, but we had the least to lose at that point. And I would strongly encourage other startups, if you're thinking of uh, doing a company and you have a even a three quarters baked product to try to put as much scrutiny to it as possible to prove its efficacy, it will be a great boost to your business if you can show an impact. Uh, that was incredibly beneficial. Other areas that haven't been so beneficial are when, uh, for, for instance, philanthropy has come in and uh, purchased or given funds for institutions to purchase our product. Uh, that's been nice in the short term, but always is a double-edged sword. Uh, because unless the budget is you know, set and you become in institutionalized, well, frankly, that is going to be a churn. And so what was a thing to celebrate uh, on one day, two years later, is going to be a thing to <laughs> mourn. Uh, and so in order to create lasting change, if you're going to take grant funds to buy products on behalf of institutions that may be not otherwise able to afford it, you've got to find sustainability there. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the biggest lever is, you know, how can philanthropy influence policy? Um, and it's happened way more in K-12, I think, than in higher ed. You know, every, uh, the ESSER funds really do earmark things like uh, proven efficacy and research uh, for products in terms of procurement, but there's nothing really the same in higher ed, and I don't, I don't know if there's something coming. Um, but I am a believer, particularly with um, artificial intelligence, there's this almost need, and I wonder if there's philanthropy that can help with this, for like a Hippocratic oath of AI in education, because the AI is moving so incredibly quickly and advancing faster than really any of us can even comprehend, and I consider myself really on top of it, uh, and it's moving faster than I, even I expected. Uh, the need to not only expect policymakers to police, but also find a way for those actors who are building together to police each other and themselves.
ourselves uh, and know when it's time to hold back and when it's time to step on the gas uh, collectively in order to do no harm and prove that the work we're doing is getting outcomes and closing equity gaps. Uh, I think that's something that uh, policy and philanthropy can, can help the industry get more closely aligned to do good together. I also want to touch, uh, maybe double click on your point around the, the philanthropy, which is to share that philanthropy often thinks of itself as risk capital mm. or catalytic capital. So we have the opportunity to step in. Obviously, there are VCs that can fund at the seed stage, but where there are gaps uh, in the funding stages or in the market, philanthropy has the opportunity to step in. But philanthropy is never thinking of itself most don't anyway, as that sustainable funder. So to the point on the double-edged sword, it could be super helpful to get something going where other sources of capital are really difficult, but philanthropy will always be looking for and who's going to pick it, pick it up, who's gonna help carry it forward. Sometimes the dollars are used for scale purposes as well. So again, lots of flexibility and range, but just pointing out that it actually is trying to help things get started but it also has a, often has a limited life in terms of how long it wants to fund. Yeah. It's not too dissimilar from other sources, but. No, for, for sure, and I'd love to hop in on that um, because what it starts to point to in you know, Joe's question is what's the advice for entrepreneurs is to actually understand the incentive alignment for the specific funders and what it is they're really about and trying to see. And so there, there is opportunity and risk and danger in the kind of capital that you take at the stage that you take it. And so just, I, I see this having been at the largest foundation, now at the largest VC firm, um, the foundations, even when they do it well, most foundations are not full of people who understand markets. And there's important work that they can do to foster the space around for-profit mission-driven but a lot of them are really dialed in deeply on, on impact and efficacy as they should be, but they don't necessarily understand markets enough to understand structure for scale. And so there are some foundations that do that well and many that don't have that blended skill. And so sometimes, and, and there's a nonprofit uh, or a for-profit uh, leader in a, in a startup that um, I'm you know, just mentoring right now, has received like a significant chunk of money from philanthropy to prove out efficacy, um, and that's really important, and does not have enough capital to actually build out the runway for full product because philanthropy only cares about the efficacy and not about once you prove it, how you're actually gonna get it to scale in that instance, and that's not a rare thing. On the other side, um, you've got variability in how many folks on the VC side are actually truly impact aligned. Because back to this other point around when you diversify that LP base, you have some folk that are not impact first and returns are great. They are now, show me the returns and impact is nice. So given that, it, it actually puts, it, it can put pressure, particularly on early stage companies. Um, like the VC game is a home run ball game. So you take that money, there are expectations about what your returns are gonna be. And if, you, if you're not on that pathway, you're gonna get dropped like a bad habit. And so like, those, are, those, are, those are some of the things to just consider. Now, I, I point those extremes. There are plenty of foundations that do that well and plenty of VC shops that do that well, but, but I, would wanna, I, would, I would advise you to be cautious in how you think about taking that early stage capital. So, for the more the traditional venture investors, impact investors, like we talked a little bit about what maybe philanthropy can do, how they can think maybe a little bit differently. What what are some things that investors could potentially like if we reflect, how can we better align our capital to fill that gap in in the instance where, you know, you've got philanthropy to initially scale, but then you need additional capital. Like what are what are some things that we as impact investors could potentially do to uh, to better align towards that gap? Maybe I'll Tyra, maybe then. Oh. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I I think the the key 
initially is we have to make sure that we really understand what is ultimately scale sustainable and scalable. And, and I think a lot of that is just having regular dialogues with fund managers that could be investing in the, in the, the subsequent stages. Um, you know, I think it's really critical that we have an opportunity to be able to support and catalyze new investments, but Tyra, as you mentioned, we are not the only, we cannot be the only source. And frankly, a, a lot of times when we're diligencing an early stage investment, I'm actually spending a lot of time talking to slightly later stage, more traditional venture investors to understand if this is something they think could be scalable. What would they need to see in order to be able to invest in this company? Because if this isn't something that ultimately can graduate to traditional investment, then that could be a concern. I will say, though, that that's really when we're thinking about something that um, is more of an MRI. And you know, as, as I mentioned before, we don't technically um, distinguish between PRI and MRI. For us, it's more venture stage and, um, and catalytic. On the catalytic side, we might be OK if there's an opportunity that is early stage, smaller TAM, but has a lot of potential to be self-sustaining. And that, I think, is where um, there really isn't a lot of interest often from traditional venture investors there and and it's it's also not a space that I think traditional philanthropy has played but this idea of finding really high quality solutions that are serving markets that might be smaller but that could really really solve a problem and that's where I think philanthropy can can be an advantage do you think that uh, you know, one thing you often, I, I often hear from from uh, other funders in this space is that you know we want to invest, but we can't lead. <laughs> we can't we can't we can't lead. We can't set the terms. Yeah. And so, in an instance like what you're describing, where traditional venture, who often is very willing to set the terms, isn't open to pursuing that opportunity, but you've got interested. Um, you know, impact investors. How can we how can we break that sort of res reticence? How, can, how exactly are you an impact investor and you don't want to lead? Right, like that, that's sort. So I, I think it's fascinating, right? Like I, I go to lots of things. I listen to people talk about investments in the education space, and admittedly, I'm looking at it from a traditional educational institution that is trying to do non traditional things, and. When you hear people call themselves impact investors, but they don't want to be first, I don't understand how that works, <laughs> right? Because by the nature of your definition, you are saying we are prepared to take risk, and then when you are presented with an opportunity to take a risk, not that risky, <laughs> right? Like, so one of the things I think is just fascinating about the entire you know, landscape is you have all these amazing people who want to do great things that if they were on the other side of the money would be risk averse. And when they move into, not you all, because you all are amazing and we love you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Let me just say that right now. And you'd be even more amazing if you invested in Paul Quinn College, but that's another <laughs> conversation. But you, you, it's just, it's the nature of having resources. Right? The more resources you have, all too often the more conservative you become. But the problems that you want to solve are problems that invite risk-taking mentalities. And I think that, I think if we could find a way to unleash the risk-taker in the well-resourced, really, really be comfortable with it, I think there aren't very many problems that we couldn't solve. So you can now drop the mic and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not before he gets a check. <laughs> we, we had our prep call. We're like circling, circling, and Michael comes in and drops the thing. And you're like, yes, and we're going to go home now. Um, no, it's such a great point. I, I really love it. It really is a great point. I, for us, I mean, I shook my head vigorously in part because I've said that. We've said that. Our team has said that. I would say in instances where some, a big part of it for us, I would say has to do with capacity. Yeah. 
which is sometimes this impact investing space, while as large as it is, can also be small in terms of staffing. So some of it's also just having the staffing to be that lead uh, on a really like technical but real level. And at the same time, sometimes it's also just finding that investor who can be or is so excited about your thing that that is the one that they're going to lead on as part of it. So that's also see the space um, that I, it, that's also spaces that I see where folks who normally don't lead will lead because it's just so exciting. And since there are many investors out there, I think part of it's also aligning with that one that they think you're the unicorn or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I, so I, I agree, Tyra. Like one, one of the underlying points you mentioned um, is, is capacity and education for a lot of foundations and family offices that actually don't understand how to do that, where it can make that distinction, which is where some of the risk comes from. Because if you talk to folk who do a lot of, or try to do a lot of impact investing from foundations, you have to ask like, which pool of capital are you talking about? Because if you're actually investing from the foundation's balance sheet, that's when the conversations get complicated and, and, and where they'll go, well, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure we have enough returns for the broader business of the foundation. Because you're, you're investing from the same pool of capital that actually drives the grant making. Is that, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Like foundations have a corpus and they have to generate returns. They invest in a bunch of stuff around the market. Those returns help them drive more grant making. When you start to invest from that pool of capital, they get risk averse if they're not gonna see market rate returns from your impact investments. Mm -hmm. And so it's the, it's the lawyers. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> it is exactly what it's a, it, Don't kill all the lawyers, <laughs> right? Not all, I, not for, all of for us, For the right? record, we, we are not condoning violence. <laughs> we, are con, we, are, we are condoning education. Of, so, so what I will say in that instance is, um, if you have more folks that understand how to think about taking parts of their pool capital that they would have had for grant making, like you've already made a decision to basically have zero returns. Think about it like that and, and increase the amount of capital that you're thinking about from a grant making standpoint, and then deploy that capital more aggressively into for-profit mission driven work. And that way the math is like, well, hell, like if I don't get any money, like at, at, at worst, if I don't see any multiples of return, if I have like, just get my money back, I did better than a grant. Mm. I did better than a grant. And now I can redeploy that capital into something else. And, and, and that's where the nuance is in terms of the risk taking, like folk thinking about the capital continuum between grant perspective, like investing that is meant to be okay with taking risks and low returns, and then the stuff that actually has to compete with other investments because you're actually putting the foundation corpus at risk. And from the entrepreneurial perspective, sometimes the most courageous thing you can do is actually walk away from money from philanthropy. Um, as someone who started a nonprofit before, I and, and now a for-profit company, I'm just like relentlessly focused on solving the most pressing problems for our customers. But when you start to take money from philanthropy, sometimes they are putting a thumb on the scale and wanting to articulate the pressing problems that they perceive in the market. And if those are not really aligned with where you're going or what you're hearing from this, the part of the market you're serving, it, it can be very tempting to say, oh, those are, there are a lot of zeros over there. I'm gonna like contort myself and my strategy to meet what you're saying and try to square the circle. And actually, um, in, in some cases, the money can be a distraction from trying to do the greatest impact you possibly can and, and grow your business. So I would say, um, if you're looking to be bold as an entrepreneur, sometimes the boldest move you can do is say no, even when the money's on the table, if it's not directly aligned with the, the problems you need to solve uh, for your business. I, I would just add, I, as a funder, share that wisdom and knowledge as well, that I don't, having led a nonprofit, for-profit venture as well, I don't want you contorting yourself because I know how off mission it takes you. Mm -hmm. Having done that myself, and I know it's really tempting, especially if you're trying to make payroll, and yet it can take you so off focus that it really isn't worth it, even for the dollars that you get at the time. So just want to underscore that, that 
when there isn't that lack of alignment, I will tell my team, it's okay. I don't want them to contort themselves. And there are too many, I would even say foundations, who are asking mm -hmm. organizations for profit and otherwise to do that, and it just does a disservice to the field itself. I feel Amen. like we need to have a moment of silence for the siren call of the payroll, <laughs> right? Because whether we realize it or not, more decisions are made to serve that end. And, and let's be clear, it is a noble end. <clears throat> As someone in my first six months of being a college payroll had to stand, meeting, uh, being a college president, had to stand in front of people and say, we can't make our whole payroll. It is the single worst experience professionally that I've had in my life. Knock on wood, I don't wanna have a worse one. But you know, so people sometimes get to bad places for good reasons. And it is hard, right? And, and you have to, as much as possible, you have to find the strength to say no. Um, but God, it's hard, right? It's awfully hard, but it's, it's not, because you will look up and realize you have no idea how you got to the place you are trying to make the money happy. So we're sort of dancing around it right now and in some of the conversations leading up to today, we talked about the need for a better matching mechanism in in the space to align the different types of capital to the the, the appropriate context, and so this is sort of a jumble. What what would that look like in y'all's mind? So, I think we need to think about a, ro a more robust ecosystem of intermediaries that that play these roles and specializing these roles and then take the right. All the bankers at the startup just, their ears just perked up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so I think that's part of it. I mean, that, candidly, like, that's why you have something like uh, an LP strategy and investing in VCs from a foundation, like they're acting as an intermediary. Like, you, even if you do some direct um, investments from a foundation, you're never gonna spin up enough expertise to be able to really manage that well. And so how do you think about other types of intermediaries that have the right return profile in terms of capital returns and impact? And then everybody's dead clear then on like, that's what this entity or a set of entities are set up to do. If you just want your money back, invest in this kind of thing, because that's the kind of returns it's gonna generate. If you are, are investing from foundation cor cor corpus and the lawyers are on your back, like maybe you slide a little bit more toward you know, the more traditional VCs that are, are, are investing, or VCs and PE that are investing um, in, 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 in education uh, and so on. So it, thinking more about how to aggregate this capital and expertise, um, I think is, is, is probably what's needed. I would, oh, okay, I said one still real quick. Um, we're gonna need a lot more robust education because I'm telling you right now, if you are an educational institution and you hear about all these companies willing to invest in education, and you realize none of them will want to invest in you, <laughs> it is a cognitive dissonance that is painful. Yeah. Because the reality of it is most of us that are providing education don't meet the criteria for the investments. And so you hear about this incredible network of resources that you can't access for the betterment of your students. And so, that, you know, I'm always sensitive about the messaging in education because I think we do an epically bad job of it, but that is coming to a boiling point because you can't have that much capital in play and it never makes its way to the places that have the greatest amount of students with the greatest amount of need. And, and my standpoint, actually connecting the dots between what you're doing and what Michael's always doing, is we've talked about having diverse founders, people who have had lived experiences with the struggles that are endemic in education. And you're always talking about finding the communities. Michael, at his school, every single student must develop a business plan before they graduate and actually start a business. And they're not always starting, you know, the scalable tech thing, but there is, pro there is talent latent in the communities that are oftentimes living in the most 
pressing problems in higher education that we need to tap into and leverage that human capital and also give them opportunities to grow the next great startup that could be the thing to solve the problem which they uniquely understand and experience. You know, I, I wasn't a first gen, low income college kid, but my co-founder was, and he's the one who's told me the experiences of his own family questioning whether he was leaving them behind or was no, oh, you're too good for us now to simply go to college. And just the, the mental friction that that caused him and the struggle that I could never have realized because I never was in those shoes. But so many students are, and there's so many other bigger problems um, around education, not to mention food and housing insecurity, and the, the deep struggles that people have that if you haven't experienced them and lived them, you're not going to solve them as well. And I think there's huge opportunity to connect the dots. Uh, among the communities we, we're trying to serve and, and to bring the talent up from within them. Uh, connecting, uh, completely agree with you, Drew, as well as connecting Henry and Michael's point on, I do agree on the intermediary. We just funded uh, an intermediary called AMP, which, which plays this matching role. Yeah, it's very much about what's in the market, what do you entrepreneur need in matching them? So I completely agree that that's one of the more efficient uh, ways to go. And when you said education, Michael, I was thinking also education on the entrepreneur side, which is this whole conversation we've just had or, and are having even more nuanced of how do you understand the different sources that are out there so that you can go looking at least in a more targeted way as opposed to all this capital in the market and you don't know what, which one really makes sense for you. And I see that from the providers. There's a, a provider, Kim Folson, who does the revenue-based finance and she's always talking about when the entrepreneur comes to her or the business comes to her, she's helping them to fix their financials so that they can be a candidate mm -hmm. for that. So she's essentially educating them so that they can be ready for her product. And I think the more we can help get that knowledge into the hands of entrepreneurs. And then I'm going to add a third thing, which is a bit of my soapbox, which is also uh, building connections and networks, because so much of this work in education, for pro like across the, I was telling someone this morning, like really social capital is what makes the world run. And so having a sense of who's who, based on our conversations and connections, sometimes it's like, I don't fund that, but I know a couple of people who do and then you put out that email or whatever the case is, pointing them to. So I think also the extent to which we can help build networks to make, at least for now, it's more inefficient, uh, but it at least helps to connect in the meantime in a real-time way what we know of, what we ourselves know as uh, capital providers of the market itself. Yeah, I'll just quickly plus one on that, Tyra, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that as um, philanthropy and funders, we just don't do a great job about sharing stuff. And frankly, you know, I think for a lot of VCs, traditional VCs, it's more competitive. Like, you're, you don't want to share stuff as much um, because you kind of want the deal. But I think for us, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. We really do want our fellow impact funders to be participating and to, you know, if it's not right for me for various reasons, I really do want to share it with another peer funder. Awesome. Well, with that, um, <laughs> I think uh, we've all got some marching orders. Um, and so uh, thank you to all the panelists for your perspectives and insights. And thank you for everyone in the audience for joining us and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Joe. Thanks.